Welcome to the fourth module in the Mid-Level Leaders in the Transition to Value program. We hope that since the last module, you've had some time to reflect on trust, listening, feedback, and collaborative decision making, and have been able to put some of these concepts into practice. So far in this series, we've explored things that you can do as a leader to support the transition to value, and we've danced around the topic of leading change. This month, we're diving straight into this topic by looking at the change process as well as the emotional side of change. We'll talk about specific things you can do as a leader of change to smooth the process and help others through the transition. Just like last month, you'll hear other hospital leaders share their perspectives on these topics, and we'll leave you with a few things to explore and pay attention to between now and the next module. So let's dive in. Change is part of all of our lives, but if you work in healthcare, you're part of more changes than many others. And because the transition to value carries with it even more uncertainty than most changes, it's even more critical for those leading the charge to be especially skilled in change leadership. You know, to be a highly skilled leader at Tri-County, first and foremost, you have to uh, make sure that you see clarity on uh, what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, if there is not uh, clarity and a unanimous uh, understanding and approach to what we're doing, uh, we obviously end up sending mixed signals to people. So that's one of the big things that we do. Uh, transparency is another key for uh, the way that we operate here at Tri-County to help make sure that everybody understands the why behind what we're doing. Um, it's very easy to tell people what to do and maybe even how to do it, but until they truly understand the why, uh, they can't necessarily do it in the best way possible. We are looking for people to bring ingenuity their own creativity, their own intelligence to the, uh, to the uh, table as we look to do that work. Highly skilled leaders in our organization do three things. They communicate, they tell the what and the why, they explain the purpose and how it relates to the benefit of the patient and to the entire system. They collaborate, they work outside their boundaries, they engage employees early and involve employees in decision making, and they're committed. They show that they're committed through their own beliefs and behaviors that support the change. And certainly, they're adaptable. As we heard in these clips, the most effective change leaders take a proactive approach to change. They pay attention to what's going on inside and outside the hospital that may require a new way of doing things. They serve as a role model for others by responding to the ever-changing environment in a thoughtful, intentional way. They advocate for their employees, and influence those above them in the organization when a plan change isn't working as intended. So most recently with COVID, we've had to do a lot of changes um, in our family practice clinics. Um, basically every day was a new rule or regulation, guideline, suggestion. So um, in our process of trying to change our care to where it's safe for staff and employees, we started with um, no patients waiting in the waiting room, then we decided that we would move all sick patients to the afternoon, and then um, we got a like mobile tenant, tent that we had outside, which was basically like a, an office outside in a tent, and we moved every respiratory patient to that tent, and we staffed it with a provider and a clinical staff um, every day. Um, so I think that was a big improvement because patients that were well weren't so afraid to go into the office and um, the respiratory patients knew that they could just come right in and right out and, and be taken care of. Um, staff at first really disliked that. Everybody was afraid uh, of the pandemic. We really didn't know a whole lot about it. You know, we thought that it lived on surfaces and we were just in full PPE. Um, after a while, though, I think um, some of the providers really enjoyed going there. It was something different. They could see that they were really helping that certain subset of patients. And then staff started volunteering. Um, at first, it was kind of volunteering. Um, staff, it's your turn to go. But, you know, after about a month or so, patients really enjoyed going out there, especially with the providers liking to do that as well. So they started to volunteer and take turns which was wonderful. Um, I actually was the one to start going out there every day because I feel like if I'm gonna ask a staff member to do something, I need to be willing to do it as well. 
So I um, designed the process. I was the clinical staff member out there every day for a couple of weeks, made sure that all the kinks were worked out, which I think is really important that you work out the kinks and not have the staff member work out the kinks if possible because it just makes it more pleasant for everyone. And then you know exactly what's going on. Let's take a minute to look at the process of change itself. Decades ago, social scientist and physicist Kurt Lewin developed a way of looking at change that is still used widely today. Lewin looked at the process of change in three steps, unfreezing, changing, and refreezing. Unfreezing involves helping others to understand the need for change and challenging the status quo. The goal is to shake up people's perceptions of how things have been done and see what the future could hold. Unfreezing sets the stage for the change itself to take place, where people start to behave in ways that are aligned with the new direction. And lastly, refreezing involves making permanent any changes to workflows, policies, reward systems, and other processes to ensure that they support the desired change and minimize the odds of reverting back to the old way of doing things. Here's an example related to the transition to value. Imagine that a healthcare organization has decided to incorporate behavioral health screenings into primary care visits to more fully address whole person care. Unfreezing might involve bringing together all providers and staff who would be affected by this change. There would likely be some education so that all parties understand why this new way of doing things is being proposed. Questions about workflow, needed resources, and staffing would be addressed collaboratively with input from across the group. Then the change would take place. Providers would begin screening patients and making referrals when warranted. Then, after some lessons are learned about what works and doesn't work, refreezing would happen. Provider pay practices, billing, referral workflows, and other processes that support this change would be made permanent. If this sounds simplistic, it is. Change is almost always more complex than this. But if you lead a change initiative, keeping this three-part model in mind, it can help you stay aware of where things stand in the big picture view. In this next interview clip, you'll hear an example of a change initiative. As the interviewee shares her story, listen for examples of unfreezing, changing, and refreezing. If you listen carefully, you'll hear all three. The one change initiative that I was kind of the leader and involved in was a reorganization of a team of RNs who um, had been working in the clinic here at Tri-County. Um, so when I got into the care manager, uh, care integration manager position, um, I had six RNs who were reporting to me and they did just a variety of tasks on the daily basis uh, and, and it varied. Um, you know, they, they oftentimes would find that, you know, the door would open and someone would come in and they'd, they'd be assigned a new task. <laughs> and so after listening to their, um, you know, some of their frustrations and really trying to understand their workload um, and help them prioritize those things, I had made this suggestion um, and started talking to the clinic supervisor that it just really felt like we needed to kind of split that group up um, and then rearrange some of that work that was assigned to them. Um, so after having that conversation with the clinic um, supervisor, then, you know, it, it it honestly didn't really go very well at first. Um, just didn't, you know, they just didn't really quite understand um, if it was necessary and, you know, things were just going fine from the clinic's point of view. Um, but I just, deep down, I knew that I was going to lose some of these nurses if I I wasn't able to kind of be their, their voice um, and explain uh, that we needed to reorganize some of this work for them. So, you know, I continued to keep working with the clinic supervisor uh, and part of that process was to just develop a proposal for the division of the work and kind of separating or creating two new teams uh, to complete that work. So after, um, you know, putting the proposal together and bringing it to administration and the clinic director, um, we then obviously then decided that we needed to bring it forward to the providers and their nurses because they really were going to be involved um, and affected by some of these changes as well too. And so um, that was kind of our next step after clinic director thought that it was sounded like a pretty good idea. Um, and so, you know, we started a series of meetings and having interactions with, you know, providers separately and then clinic nurses separately and then kind of pulled everybody together. And really, we were <laughs> kind of my philosophy is I plant a seed 
and then a couple weeks later I put a little bit of water on it and then you know a few days later then I'm going to put some fertilizer on it and so it's kind of this process and I say that to my employees sometimes too you know I just you know, it takes time for people to um, really grasp onto that and understand how it's going to benefit them and then the patient and everybody all together so um, just really kind of helping them understand how having this RN alongside them in the clinic was necessary and that we just really needed to de redefine the roles. Um, so again, lots of meetings and it was actually about a year of planning and conversations. I never thought we would make it, <laughs> um, but we did. We set a deadline for implementation of the changes and we have met those. Um, and so we split up the groups and we divvied up the work uh, and things have been absolutely successful um, resounding you know conversations you hear about people and why didn't we do this a long time ago and and it wasn't that it was a bad situation it was just that um, they, you know you just never know what you have until you have it sometimes so uh, we continued to meet after the transition and we actually still do continue to meet and make sure that um, you know, as uh, we meet as care teams and discuss, you know, kind of what everyone's roles are. And then we also meet just as that RN group together because it's just good for them to be able to communicate and just kind of explain what each of them are doing and make sure everybody's on the same page. A lot of the literature on managing change focuses on the rational side. Things like planning the initiative, identifying milestones, and preventing roadblocks. What is often overlooked, however, is the emotional side. Change is a really emotional process. Think about the changes you've been part of. You may have undergone big changes like career transitions, or selling your house and moving across the state or across the country, or a more narrowly focused change, like implementing a new software system, getting a new boss, or moving offices. There's the logical, rational side that tells you the change makes sense, or doesn't, and helps you lay out a plan for carrying it out. But then there's the emotional side, having to get out of your comfort zone, living with uncertainty and doubt, maybe even second guessing whether you're doing the right thing. In their book, Switch, authors Chip and Dan Heath make a great analogy. They say that whenever we're experiencing or driving change, our brains are operating on two levels, the rational and the emotional. They liken the rational side to a rider, creating a plan and methodically directing activities toward the end goal. The elephant represents the emotional side. If you look at a picture of a rider and an elephant, the rider kind of looks like they're in charge, but they're pretty small compared to the elephant. If there's disagreement between the two, the elephant is going to win every time. The same thing happens when the rational and emotional part of your brain are in conflict during a change. The emotional side wins almost every time. Let's look for a minute at the emotions people often experience over the course of a change. This curve may look familiar to you. It follows the consecutive stages of grief identified by Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in the 1960s. A body of research conducted since then supports the idea that this same pattern shows up in the emotions we experience during change. The stages are denial, shock, feeling overwhelmed, feeling that it may not affect me or may not happen at all, anger, which is underlying pain that sometimes comes out in negative ways toward others, bargaining or negotiation, depression, feeling empty, we're not talking about clinical depression, just a feeling of emptiness, specifically in the context of the change. And acceptance, acceptance of a changed reality with the sense that the new reality is permanent. In the real world, this process isn't always quite this neat or well-defined, and studies have found that we can move backwards on this curve as well, not just forward. As you're going through a change, however, and supporting yourself and others as things progress, it can be helpful to remember that change actually often involves grief letting go of the past, and accepting a new reality. Remember that even when a change is positive, there's still a process of letting go of the past and adjusting to a new reality. So given all this, what can you do as a leader to help others adjust to a new reality and move along the change curve? Noel Tishy, a faculty member at the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan, developed a way of classifying the types of impact that a change can have on a given person. Several researchers have built on Tishy's classification since then, and it's become a valuable tool for helping others through the process of change. Let's go back to our example of integrating behavioral health screening into primary care. 
Imagine that the proposed change is for primary care providers to conduct screenings and then refer patients to other providers for behavioral health support. Let's think a little bit about the impact this would have on a primary care provider, a nurse, or a medical assistant new to these screenings, and possibly new to the field of behavioral health in general. When they first hear about the proposed change, they might wonder about the technical aspects. Do I know enough about behavioral health to do this justice? Do I have the time to fit this in with the other things I have to do? Is this just one more thing I'm going to have to do hundreds of clicks in order to get done? They might think about the political aspect, their own power and influence. A provider might wonder if doing this type of screening means that they no longer have control over any behavioral health related discussions with the patient. Or, if there's someone who has a lot of experience in behavioral health but had no input on the screening form, their lack of input into the process might be another politically based source of frustration for them. They might also think about the cultural aspect. How does this process connect with their values? If their long-held mindset is that behavioral health and physical health are two separate things that need to be addressed separately, this new process goes against that mindset. If, on the other hand, an integrated approach fits with their view, they might have an easier time with it. If someone is stuck in one of the early stages of the change curve, like denial or anger, it can be helpful to use this framework to think through potential areas of concern for this person. Are they angry because of a technical concern, political concern, or cultural concern? There are specific things that you can do as a leader to address it, depending on the source of the concern. And remember that if all we do is share data to try to move someone along the curve, we're only addressing the rider or the rational side of the picture. We need to address the elephant or the emotional side with stories and understanding. See the resource guide associated with this series for more information and for a worksheet to help you identify the source. It was, it was a long, it was a very long process and, um, and I think just hesitation from staff and everyone initially, but it's just in communication with my RNs or the RNs that report to me, I mean, it's, they, they're so happy. They're just so happy. I, I can't even, they, they say, I can't even believe we are where we were before and where we're at now. So it's, it's been really good. Before we end this module, let's take a few minutes to talk about managing our own emotions during the change process. When you're leading a change, not only are you responsible for paying attention to other people's emotions, or elephants, but you've also got your own to manage. The positive emotions we experience when leading a challenging process give us a lot of momentum toward our goal. When we feel energized, for example, that means our rider and elephant are aligned. Our emotions are driving us in the direction our rational side is aiming for. When we feel frustrated, angry, or demoralized, however, it can be difficult to keep working toward that end vision. We tend to get sidetracked or stop moving altogether. In these situations, our elephants have overtaken our rider. So what can you do when you find yourself stuck? The first thing you can do is to honor your elephant. That just means that you recognize when you're feeling frustrated or de-energized and recognize it without judging yourself. Sometimes when you identify how you're feeling, you might be able to connect it to a spot on the change curve. Feeling demoralized, for example, might mean you're in the dip of depression on the curve. Then think about the source of your feelings. Is it technical, or you just don't have the time, knowledge, or resources to move forward? Is it political, or you just don't have the power to impact your environment the way you'd like? Or is it cultural, where what you're experiencing is conflicting with your personal values? If you can identify the source, you can use the same strategies with yourself as you would with someone else. And again, see the reflection and planning worksheet in the resource guide. Wow, we've covered a lot in this module. Next time we'll take a look at the basics of healthcare finance. If you're thinking, yikes, I'm not a finance person, don't worry. This module is designed to provide a high level overview of financial concepts for non-finance professionals. Between now and the next module, we encourage you to reflect on these questions on your own or discuss them with your colleagues to help you think through how the information covered in this module applies to you and your organization. What kinds of changes are you currently experiencing or leading? What examples of unfreezing, changing, or refreezing have you seen in these changes? How are these change initiatives going? If they're going well, why? If they're not going so well, why aren't they? Think of one specific change initiative you're currently leading or have led in the past and identify one person who resisted that change. Where did they get stuck on the change curve? 
Would you classify the source of their resistance as technical, political, or cultural? Think of one specific change initiative you're currently experiencing. Where are you on the change curve? If you're a bit stuck, is it due primarily to technical, political, or cultural factors? How can you address these challenges? And here are a few things for you to consider doing between now and the next module. Talk to your direct supervisor about current or upcoming change initiatives. Find out what they most expect from you during the course of this change, and share with them what you need most from them in order to meet these expectations. Find out what changes they're working on that are particularly difficult. Ask what their biggest challenges are, how they're working to address them, and what they've learned from the experience so far. Use the planning and reflection worksheet in the resource guide to develop strategies for addressing technical, political, or cultural concerns that someone on your team might have about a current or upcoming change. Listen to one or more episodes of the Center's podcast, Managing from the Middle, Leading Through Change. For additional information and resources on any of the topics covered in this module, see the resource guide that accompanies this program. And of course, please feel free to contact us at the Center anytime for additional support. And we have a request. We need your feedback. On the main webpage dedicated to this series, there's a Give Feedback link. At any time during the course of this series, or even multiple times, please go to our website and share what was valuable for you and any suggestions you have for making this series better. We thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to continuing the conversation over the next few months.